Good morning and welcome to America's Mart Live to the main stage. I'm Kimberly Whitman. I'm your host of the stage today. We've got an amazing lineup of speakers. Thanks to Creative Co-op, our wonderful sponsor here. Today, first we're going to welcome Tom Miraboli. That's a tongue twister one. Mara Tom Miraboli is the SVP of Global Trend and Design at Lifetime Brands, as well as an editor for Pantone. He travels the world globally to do some research for us and find out what trends and colors, and he forecasts what all of our customers are going to be looking for in the year to come. So today, he's going to give us a better understanding of the desires and the expectations of your customers. Let's welcome Tom Miraboli. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I want to thank you first off just for, uh, I'm setting a timer so I don't go over because I can go on. Um, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to say thank you first for, uh, you know, just being here because it's, it's early and uh, I, I always appreciate people getting up early. Sandra Harden. Chris Anami. Um, sorry, it's, I always see people here. So I feel better because you're all my friends. Um, so uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a, an honor. This is one of the shows that I've always wanted to speak at. Um, and uh, I do a lot of speaking for different people. But um, one of the things that's, that's my job that I, I love doing is sort of getting people aligned with who the market is. You know, I think we all go around with this picture in our heads of what, you know, who's the consumer? Who are they? How old are they? Are they married? Are they single? And we have this picture in our heads of a, you know, a, uh, you know, that the people that we're selling to is a family with maybe, you know, two kids, a couple, husband, wife, two kids, dog and a half, you know, whatever it is. And, and it's so off of where the market is right now. So it's really important to sort of realign ourselves and say, okay, who are we really selling to? What do they really want? Um, so that's what I'm here to tell you today. Now, everything that you see, you're going to be able to um, access online right after this. There's a lot of charts and graphs and just ignore all that crap um, and just, uh, you know, come up with any questions you have and we'll talk about them afterwards. But let's start looking at some of the facts and sort of start that realignment. So when we look at home right now, in my opinion, there are five sort of vital consumer trends five things that are really changing the way people buy, the way people sell. The first is new directions in the American household. Just a redefinition of what the American household is. The second is the reinvention of value. We used to think about value as dollars and cents. It's how big is it, how much does it cost, you know, price, size, quantity, things like that. The value equations really changed, uh, particularly for millennials. Um, rapid growth in the creative class. We are creative beings. Um, better than 60% of Americans think of themselves as makers now. That's a huge number. So how do you talk to people who are creative and are not just buying things off the shelf because they have a brand on them or because they have a name on them? Health is the new wealth. I'm going to show you how even though most of you here probably don't think health and wellness has anything to do with what you do in your business or how you run your business, um, but it's very, very important right now. And the last one is consumers taking control. The retailer's not in control anymore, consumers are. Consumers trust each other at a rate of about 98% when it comes to rating products. They trust what retailers have to say about their products only at about 27%. So that's a big gap and it means that you've got to get social and you've got to be heard and you've got to make sure that people are talking about what you're selling. So let me just ask you a quick question. How many of you show of hands are retailers here? Okay, and how many of you are wholesalers? Wow, that's great, that's perfect. Okay, because this presentation was meant for people on both sides of the fence, so to speak, um, because it affects what we, what we make as well as what we sell. So let's look at the first trend, new directions in the American household. There are a lot of big changes, um, and that means that, uh, that means that we have to approach things a little bit differently. But first, what is the average household? Well, really, right now, there is no average household. Um, when we look at some of the stats, what in the USA right now, single person households are at 28% and they continue to rise. Um, when we say 28%, that means 28% of households in America are not people who are single. They are one person living in one household. 
So, and that's a huge number of people. That is affecting the way Costco looks. It's selling, you know, that sort of 700 things of toilet paper. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's affecting the way that we look at marriage. Uh, marriage rates are falling uh, because, not just because of cohabitation, but people are living longer and so they're getting married later. Um, so, 57% of households have no children at all. That's up 8% from 1970. And here's a real kicker. Only 20%, 23% of households in the United States are married people with children. That's a really low percentage, you know? So um, that's down 16% from 1970, big, big drop. So again, just constantly challenge who's walking in your door, who, who are your customers, who are you selling to? Um, one of the things that's actually been good for our business is what we call the rise of the renter. Um, and that is that the home ownership rate in the U.S. has tumbled um, to its lowest level in nearly a half a century. 37% of Americans now rent rather than buy. Um, a lot of it is financially driven, but it's important to understand that, and again, you'll look at all these charts later, it's important to understand that this is across generations. And there, there's a reason for it. Um, the reason's usually financial, but the way people buy home products when they're owning a home versus the way they buy home products when they are um, renters are very different. When we rent a home, we tend to buy things to personalize that home rather than spending money on home improvements, you know, a, new, a second bathroom, an extra bedroom, splitting off rooms that'll make the home more saleable. We really tend to dedicate a lot more funds to other things. Why smaller home size? Well, there are a lot of reasons. The home size in the U.S. has gone down about 11% um, in the last few years. And one of the big reasons for that is because there are more rentals. Smaller household size also has a lot to do with a lot of singles. Um, so that means that you're having to work with smaller space. There's two businesses that have really flourished. One is storage, and also we're seeing a lot on Pinterest about wallscaping. The idea of wallscaping is exactly what it sounds like. It's sort of decorating the walls, making sure that walls are not just functional, uh, uh, not just decorative objects, but they're functional objects. So more shelves, more frames, more things that actually perform a function. Also, just some significant spending trends, things that, you know, just big picture what's going to happen in homes. So Hispanics are going to nearly double their retail spending in the next 10 years. Um, this, this is all McKinsey data. Baby boomers are a source of tremendous spending growth, um, including food and housewares. So 47 million households headed by people over the age of 55 are going to account for about 92% um, growth in housewares and 73% in apparel. 56% um, in apparel, I'm sorry. And then millennials are going to account of one third of all retail spending by 2020. Now, you're probably going to say, you know, well, Millennials are already like a huge influence, but it's an important shift because right now, millennials are a, up to now, millennials have really been an influencer, okay? They're living, they've been moving back in with their parents, they're living at home more, they live on average. Um, millennials exit college with an average of about $37,000 in debt. A lot of them have moved back in with their parents. They're closer with their parents than boomers ever were. Like when I was a kid, I'm a boomer, the first year boomer. And um, when I was a kid, it was like, I could not get out of that house fast enough. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, but really in truth, millennials are very friendly with their families. They're extremely close. M most millennial women say that they're one of their, their mother is one of their best three friends. Um, and so when we look at that, it's important to understand that while they've been a big influencer up to now in terms of style, they've, they've led us into more personalized style looks, they've led us into more modern looks, now they're really going to start affecting spending, uh, really the, the dollar amount of it. The other thing is that men are spending more. Men are shopping more, they're spending more time at grocery, they're spending more time at gift retail, more time in housewares, and for better or for worse, usually better, men are horribly worse shoppers. They don't use coupons as much. <laughs> they're much easier to distract. Uh, they're very, you know, squirrel. So if you can give them something <laughs> that, that uh, interests them, uh, then you're really on, you know, you're really on to something. They're not, they are much less object driven. So they're not going to go in with a list the way a female shopper will. Um, men respond best to detailed product descriptions. 
um, and product comparisons. They love comparisons on price. They love comparisons on style. Um, they also usually shop based on immediate need. And what's great about immediate need is they go in ready to spend. It's, it's sort of your ability to distract them once they're in the door. And they're less interested in discounts, which is wonderful. So. <laughs> Um, we also look, um, I don't know how to go back, oh, there we go. Um, we also look at renovation. So I know a lot of people here are concerned about renovation. Renovation spends, this is a house survey and I don't know how well you can read it, but renovation spends are still high. Um, they're, you know, there was a, f uh, uh, you know, they were pretty much flat for next year. They're expecting a 2% growth for this year. And the vast majority of it is going into decorating. So 60% of consumers who plan on renovate, deter, who plan on renovating, define renovation as redecoration, and that's where you come in. Also consider there are a lot of changes in new homes. So we're seeing homes that have flexibility, that have more bedrooms, uh, you know, the more bedrooms, more smaller bedrooms, larger social spaces. Um, the kitchen is really the hub of the home, so one of the things you really need to think about is we all tend to think of like, oh, well, the living room is the hub of the home. It's not. The living room is determined really pretty much as a gaming space, as some place that we go to be social, we game, we watch movies, but the place where we talk to each other is the kitchen. And a lot of companies ignore the fact that there's so much living going on in the kitchen. So we, um, the, uh, you know, and, and we're seeing a lot of conversions. We're seeing full bathrooms on the first floor, more full bathrooms, because older consumers don't, you know, people are much healthier, much older, but they're still not always as flexible, and you have people who don't want to, you know, walk up a ton of stairs. 60.6 um, .6 million people, that's 19% of the population, lived in a multi-generational home last year. Um, that's a huge number, so people are still living with, um, with their kids. Decor becomes an important part of secondary rooms, and this, again, is just something to look at later, um, but across all rooms, 11% increase in, um, in decor. You know, where is it growing? It's growing in living and family rooms, it's growing in master bedrooms. Uh, we see it also growing pretty significant in laundry rooms um, because storage has become a very important thing. So it's, uh, it's just crucial that we keep an eye on. You want to assort, you want to develop based on where people are growing their homes. It just makes logical sense. But many of us get stuck in this pattern of developing product year after year that's the same product we've developed before. There's a tremendous amount of land grabbing going on. Um, and when I say land grabbing, I mean people who normally, let's say they did case goods, now they're starting to sell decorative accessories. People who sell, and it's not just at the wholesale level, it's at the retail level. Because we don't live in, we don't live in a, in a category, okay? You go to anthropology, great example. Go to anthropology and they started out with clothing and jewelry and then they did a little bit in home and now they're going, they're doing a lot more home, now they're in tabletop, now they're in gifting. So you have a lot more competition and it's important to keep aware of where are people actually developing um, you know, home-wise? This is something, I apologize, it's very hard to read here. Um, but what it does is it breaks down for you what are the popular styles right now. So at the top, you see contemporary, uh, popular interior design styles. Um, so $60 billion net in home decor sales. Contemporary is at the top. Two below that, you see modern, okay? so. Um, because a lot of people don't differentiate between contemporary and modern, it's important to understand that when you lump those two together, contemporary and modern own the, the lion's share of looks right now. Um, a lot of it is because of millennial influence. A lot of it is because we feel very cluttered. We want to look clean again. We want to feel clean. We want some breathing room. So keep an eye on that. Um, transitional is what you see at the bottom here. Okay? So this is transitional which is somewhere between, you know what transitional means if you're here. Um, and then, but just again, keep in mind, and traditional is the longest one. But look at how close traditional is to contemporary. Very, very close. And if you add modern onto contemporary, contemporary oversteps it. So just start cleaning up. <laughs> um, the, um, oops, sorry. So we were talking about uptrending and about uh, th there being more competition. There we go. 
Okay. So competition for home dollars. As apparel dips from 5% of the U.S. consumer spending to 3.3% in 2015, people like J.C. Penney, Urban Outfitters, Anthropology are moving more and more to home decor. That means more competition. It also means that, you know, it's, it's definitely more popular, so just keep an eye on that. And then we look at, um, this was a gifts and deck survey that for those of you who didn't see it came out recently. But again, always keep an eye on what are people buying? You know, so when home products consumers plan to buy in the next 12 months, 72% of consumers plan to buy deck accessory. 71% plan to buy throw pillows. 58% tend to buy, uh, plan to buy wall art and 49% plan to buy lamps. Again, think of if you're, if you're, whether you're a retailer or a manufacturer, start looking at yourself in terms of Am I a solution neighborhood? Are consumers coming to me and knowing that they're planning on buying all of this, am I just a deck pillow resource? You know, am I a lamp resource? Should I be having other things? Because people don't, people buy in neighborhoods of solutions, as my friend Susan says. Bridal trends, okay, so bridal trends are a big deal, was a big market. 1.4 million couples register every year. Over $10 billion are spent on total bridal gifts every year. And 50% um, set up a registry online. Look, there's been a big fall off in registries, and there's a good reason for it. Um, we're living longer. You know, uh, divorce rates among 50 and overs is as high as divorce rates for first year marrieds. And part of the reason is we realize we're going to live longer. So it's like, am I, do I really want to be with this old crow for another 25 years? You know, I mean, you really look at it. It's like, it's like you know, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, stuck with this person. So we have, uh, so a lot of people are looking at second marriage, so, you know, and, and, uh, and they're not registering for their second marriage because they've got plenty, okay? So when marriage rates start to fall, we have to, we have to encourage gifting for other reasons. But that said, bridal, bridal is still a big business. And one of the things that we've noticed is, let's look at, I left off all the things that are falling, like formal dinnerware and all of this. But let's look at the things that are growing, OK? So now this is a comparison. I don't know if you can see it. Between 2014 and 2016, percent change, OK? So bakeware is up 39% in those two years in registries. Um, this is top gift categories. Um, so cookware up 47%. Deck home up 53% as an item that people put on a registry. 37% kitchen accessories. 47% barware. Barware is an incredibly important category right now. Make sure you don't miss it. 56% um, casual dinnerware. 50% kitchen appliances or kitchen accessories. Now, here's where we start. Here's where I think we're losing, okay? When you've got 28% increase in cash gifts, 63% increase in contribution to honeymoon funds, and 44% increase in gift cards, we're not inspiring people enough. We've got to get a hold of these people because all this is lost money to us. It's great that people are still spending money on registries, but we're the ones to blame if we don't provide them with enough interesting things. And also 75% in, uh, increase in contributions to charities. Uh, instead of registries. Now, I have nothing against charitable causes, but I want the money. <laughs> I've got to stay in business. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then bath items up 53%. So, um, all right, so we talk a lot about generations, but um, I want to just sort of give some clarity, some size to who these people are. So let's look, millennials. How many, how many of you out here are millennials? 20 to 36 years old. Okay, good. So, Pardon me if I talk shit about you, okay? So, uh, <laughs> goddamn millennials. Um, no, millennials, 87 million people, okay? That is, the, the biggest boomers ever got was 82 million, and right now they're at about 78 million. Um, but 25% uh, of the population, 35% of recent home purchases, they have never been paying more attention to our categories than they are right now. 42% of them are homeowners, 42%. Now, consider the fact that about a third of this generation is still in high school. <laughs> so to have this many, this is the first year that millennials surpassed every other generation in home purchases, okay? They are a force to be reckoned with. We have to pay attention to them. Um, Gen Xers. Gen Xers get left out a lot, okay? But look at the stats here. They're only 15% of the population, true. 
26% um, are recent home buyers. 65% of them are homeowners. And they are, we'll, we'll talk about, they're in peak needs years. So this, this generation is, at, is, is starting to max out. Sorry to let you all know, but you're maxing out on, on uh, your income. Uh, how many here are 37 to 51 year olds? Oh, good, excellent. Chris, I don't lie, I know how old you are. Uh, <laughs> And then boomers, my personal favorite. Uh, 57 to 70 years old, 79 million people, 23% of the population, 31% of recent home buyers. 76% are already homeowners. And the good news here, which doesn't show, is that many of them have already paid for their homes. So they've got a lot more disposable income. 36% um, of average household spending, but that's average spending on household. Um, this generation has 46% of the disposable income in the United States, okay? And we're gonna talk about their wealth later. Do not forget boomers. How many of you are boomers? Okay. Do not forget boomers. I know it's tempting. We love millennials. We love the shit out of you. But you guys are not yet spending tremendous amount of money. You're a huge influencer. I mean, millennials are influencing the way we expect service, the way we expect things to look, the, the freedom that we enjoy in buying. But still, they are, honestly, they're, they're still very debt laden. So, um, and then 71 or over, 32 million people. Now, I don't want to seem ageist. This generation, just to keep it in mind, only spends about 2% of their income on home products. So it's important, you know, it's important to just keep in mind that they're not a huge home consumer. They're not a huge gift consumer. Um, they're very wealthy, quite frankly, many of them, but they are giving a lot of their financial um, assets to boomers to make decisions with and to help stay with the family. Um, in 2016, millennials represented 35% of home purchases more than any other generation that year. So, um, so, how do different generations buy differently? What are they buying? You know, and this is important because, uh, just a question. How many of you would say that your store caters to a certain generation? Okay. How many would say that their, your store is non-generational? You cater to every generation. Okay. How many of you don't have a store? No. <laughs> I had four people answer. You've got to wonder. Um, but um, look at the way people are buying differently. So your first column is millennials. Your second is Gen X. Your third is boomers. Together, everything kind of starts, you know, everything starts off the same. 96% of, 92% are going to buy birthday gifts. And, you know, 70 to 75% are going to buy Hanukkah gifts. Mother's Father's Day, pretty much the same. Then you start seeing things fall off. So for, for wedding gifts, Millennials are going to buy 53% wedding gifts versus other generations, which are about 42 pulled together. You know, um, new baby. Baby boomers are not buying almost anything for new baby gifts. Those gifts are being bought by millennials and Gen X. So it's an important thing to say, if I'm assorting to, if I'm assorting generationally smart, make sure that you're really, I mean, you, you know, you start seeing big disparities between how people are buying, you know, just because, just because millennials 34%, but wealthier generations buy more just because gifts than millennials do by a, by a large margin. So just keep an eye on who you're selling to. Millennials love authenticity. So percent of US consumers who prefer vintage furniture by age group, millennials prefer vintage furniture. 62% of them prefer vintage, vintage furniture. Now, Honestly, if I was a retailer, I would think I was buying vintage furniture to appeal to a boomer audience, but that's not the way it is. Um, also, 16 to 18% of Americans will stop, will shop at a thrift store in, during the coming year. It's a big percentage. How much are we losing to that? Is it for price or is it for style? And when we de delve deeper into the survey, we find out that it's not about price. That's just about getting a bargain. It's because they're buying retro product. They want, yeah, it's very sad that now everything I owned when I was, a, a, you know, in my 30s is vintage. Um, but uh, so let's look at just a little bit about these, these generations. Compared to um, when we look at how, how do you feel about hosting parties and gatherings in your home, okay? Millennials in green love it. 56% say they love it. 51% of Gen Xers say they love it. 
52% of boomers say, meh. <laughs> you know, so again, all this information is just to help you make the right decision. If you're carrying an entertaining product, who are you really selling it to? Um, furniture and bed bedding spending in the US. Again, by generation. Look at who's going up and who's going down, okay? So right now, Gen X, $31 billion, okay? Baby boomers, $34 billion. You know, so you really get a sense of who's going up. Baby boomers have dropped 17% in two years, okay, on furniture and, and accessories. And Gen X is hitting their peak spending years. So when we look at Gen X, very important, they are now in their prime earning years. This is a, a boring graph of income versus expenditure, but basically what you're seeing is this 45 to 50, uh, well, actually, it's um, 35 to 55. 35 to 55, blue is income, okay? And gray is expenditure. These are the, th those 20 years, 35 to 55, are the highest, especially 35, uh, yeah, right here. So that's, that's who you want to sell to. That's who you want to engage. Baby boomers. Okay, baby boomers are so incredibly important, I can't say it enough. They're set to inherit $15 trillion in the next 20 years. They're not getting poorer. <laughs> and frankly, a lot of them aren't getting older. They're very, very healthy. They have never been healthier. Um, there are more than 100 million people over the age of 50 in the United States. They represent 45% of overall beer, wine, and spirit, spirit dollar sales in the US. So this whole bar trend is a result of what the boomers are doing. We are drinking like fish. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so 50, 50 plus also represents the world's fastest growing group online sales. And there's a reason, because now I don't have to go like that because I've got an iPad, I've got, a larger, I've got a larger Samsung phone that's about to explode in my pocket probably, but um, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, let's look at some, base, some important stats here about boomers, 55 and over three times the net worth of younger generations. They control 75% of American wealth, and they outspend other generations by $400 billion a year. Do not leave boomers behind. Don't do it. I'm not gonna say any names, Target, but who's been leaving boomers behind and who is suffering for it right now? You can see them, you know, they're not engaging. Ikea's doing really well, but they're not engaging boomers. If they could engage boomers, they'd be doing incredibly well. Um, baby boomers are still spending, they're the wealthiest generation. They own 70% of the wealth in the US and they spend about 94, uh, they spend on 94% of consumer, ca uh, consumer categories. So um, very important. Uh, and they spend about three times more than millennials on home renovation at this point. So then we look across all generations. So what are some of the standards? The live-in kitchen. Modern Family Hysterical Series, of course, but it's really changed the standards, and you're seeing it all across different uh, types of TV uh, shows. It's changed the standard for what is the ideal kitchen. So the kitchen is a social space. It's not just a functional space anymore. Um, and so we have to look at that and say, okay, well, you know, what are, what are the, you know, how are we living in there? Are we decorating this space? A tremendously underserved uh, in terms of decor. So second trend, don't worry, it's, it's shorter. Uh, the reinvention of value. I'm just going to rock it through this one. But so, what is value now? If it's not money, if it's not price, um, what is it? Um, Nielsen did a really interesting survey, and they asked um, 6,000 Americans across the country to rate the things that were most important to them in the final decision of whether or not to buy something. And three floated to the top. Does it save me space? Does it save me time? Does it save me money? So, space, time, money. How many people think money was number one? How many people think space was number one? How many people think time was number one? Absolutely, save me time. Save me time was by far number one. It, it outstripped by about 20% save me money. Um, because time is the value. Now, it, we've, never been selling, we've never been selling intangibles so heavily. Intangibles are extremely important. So what are the new value drivers? What is value now? Um, I'm gonna skip this one. Intangibles, emotional, personal relationship. Things that create a personal, uh, personal feeling, 
um, a quarter of all American adults, 18 and over, made one or more luxury purchases, which is what's keeping the luxury business alive. But we're mixers, we're brand blenders now. We mix luxury with every day. We don't want just to have, you know, even, even the lowest income have one, ha have significant luxury, uh, or rather one luxury item. So the value of design, pretty and functional. Sensory elements, color, shape, texture, material. Convenience, is it easy to use? Is it ergonomic? Can I save time with it? Can I take a step out? Problem solving, build a better mousetrap. Multifunction, uh, you know, a, a, a uh, apple core that's also a peeler. I mean, a simple example. Um, is it on trend? On trend has never been more important, even in gifting. You know, so make sure that you know what's on trend with, um, with, with regards to gifting, house first, Pinterest, of course, is a great resource. Cultural excitement. So does it have heritage? Is there an artisan quality to it? And store inspiration uh, and, and curation. People go to stores for inspiration. The value of less. Consumers are increasingly embracing this idea of the luxury of less. Airspace. So, and that means multifunction too. So when you have home decor that multifunctions as lighting or that multifunctions as storage or that multifunctions as mirrors, always important. The value of compassion. So this idea of giving back, um, there are some wonderful companies uh, that do this. Um, Whitney Howard Designs, which is right here, uh, 2011 in here. Don't leave without seeing them. Uh, it's Whitney Howard. Uh, they are amazing, uh, 2011. And they're, they're about giving back. They're about, uh, same thing with um, somebody else I'm thinking of, uh, Chavez, which is over on 18 in building one. Brilliant people. Cause-related marketing is important. People want to buy things that will send them, that will send a message that they're compassionate. You know, Amazon Smile. Did you, did, just show of hands, how many of you knew that just by going in through a specific portal, you can give a percentage of your Amazon purchase to charity? I, I'm amazed. I only found, you know, I'm supposed to be on with this shit, but I, I honestly didn't even find out until about uh, a month ago. I was so surprised. Um, and different ways, you know, people like Wayfair, Blog It Forward, you know, Patagonia said for Black Friday they're donating 100% of their sales to charity. You know, just these unexpected quick bursts of charitable action. The value of expertise, what's new, what's now, what's next. Keeping your, especially in gifting and in home, keeping your customers in the know is incredibly important. When you look at people like Bloomingdale's, people like you know, Pinterest, Wayfair. Wayfair, look, I love Wayfair, okay? Great assortment, great prices. The, the most incredible thing about them is how on trend they keep you, how they keep you, they give you ideas, they tell you what's new, what's now, what's coming, and all of that. The value of story. Anthropology, the vast majority of what you're gonna buy in anthropology, is anybody here from anthropology? Okay, good, I can talk shit about them. So the vast majority of anything you're gonna buy in anthropology is probably about 15% mm, more than where you'd see it anywhere else. Um, it's, it's expensive, but people buy it because it's got great craftsmanship, it's got great story, and that's there. You walk in the door and you know you're not gonna see a single thing that doesn't have craftsmanship to it. You know that if you have a stack this tall of bowls, every one of them is gonna be different, and that's, that's the give. So story does more than deliver facts about a product. It establishes an emotional connection between a consumer and a brand. A Blue Q. Okay, I, I gotta go back. How many of you know Blue Q? I love Blue Q. I love them because I get to wear snarky socks to meetings and things. But this is a company that, went, that made a business out of oven mitts, okay? They made socks, who would have thought? Anybody, in, anybody sitting out here, myself included, would have said socks, socks are ready for business, I'm not going there. They turned socks into a gift business. You know, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And if you don't know the line, go see it. Um, it's uh, in, in building one. The value of omnichannel. I don't need to tell you, omnichannel is important. It's a matter of convenience. Um, you have to engage. People who buy on Omnichannel uh, in, uh, across various platforms, per, uh, first, Omnichannel accounts for, eight, uh, promos account for 83% of unplanned purchases, which is extremely important online. 
65% of unplanned purchases were made in store, but many of them were inspired online. And it's important to understand that people, online is not the enemy. People who shop online buy on average almost three times home, of home products of what people buy when they're in store alone, shopping in store alone. The value of inspiration. Shoppers don't have to shop in stores. We have to, in, we have to inspire them. You know, I always say, somebody just asked me, you know, what makes a great buyer? And I said, a great buyer cannot walk by a retail store without going in. They, they can't, you know, and I think that shoppers are turning into that as well. So when we look at the top three reasons why consumers shop in-store instead of online, 60% say it's the ability to see and touch, 40% say it's the, to avoid shipping costs, and 32% say it's inspiration and gift ideas. The value of service. So service is incredibly important, uh, we know that. But when consumers were asked, this is a vision critical survey, what are the top five favorite service offerings? Free home delivery and shipping was number one. A customer loyalty program, which had kind of got out the window for a while, is number two. 30 day, no questions asked return policy, early access to sales and promotions, and a well designed, easy to use website. The value of versatility, multi-purpose and multi-function, especially in space-starved homes, is really important. So I just put some pictures up here of some great products that are uh, multi-purpose. I love this frame at the bottom that's also a table, or these stairs. I want to go home and do that to my stairs. I saw this picture, and I called a guy in and asked him, you know, how much would it be to do this to my stairs? And he said $30,000, so when I regained consciousness, um, I, <laughs> I told him I'd put it off until my next mortgage. But, um, you know, look at this, this sofa that turns into a, a bunk beds. It's <laughs> just crazy. But also, a part of this is about just um, versatility, the ability to create something. It gives people a sense of creation when they can change objects. So versatility, like this great desk that becomes a uh, Murphy bed. Who was Murphy? I don't know, we still call it that. Uh, this kitchen table, this like built-in kitchen table. Rapid growth of the creative class. So we talked about how important the maker is. Um, and then here's a, a house survey that basically just gives you some of the stats on um, planned average renovation spends and blah, blah, blah. But home is where we really spend our money. So you know, when we look at the most popular Pinterest categories in the US as of this February, um, we see that we've got um, art, decorative accessories are really one of the number ones. Personalization. Important gift attributes, this is important. So if you're in the gift business, and this is a GDA study, personalization was 64% said it was an important gift attribute. A gift card was 45%. Inspiration was 34%. Customizable was 31%. These are big numbers. So make sure that you can check off some of these boxes when you're giving gifts or when you're developing gift products. 135 million adult makers in the US, that's 57% of the population, consider themselves makers, think that they can make something. So how do you feed that creative mind? You know, millennials, millennials' greatest gift to the world is that they've encouraged us to be individuals. They've encouraged us to create again. Crafting and creation hasn't been this big since the 70s, and even then it was probably only about 25% of the population, usually people who didn't work. So, um, Etsy, 2.5 billion in sales in 20, 2015. So we're not looking to steal money back from the crafters, but how do we teach people something new? How do we make gifting and DIY a part of what we do? And a lot of terrific product ideas come out of Pinterest. Um, this uh, product on the right, woman had a bunch of old clipboards. She didn't know what to do with them. And she made these terrific, just wall art, you know, you know sort of, um, uh, you know, statements of love and laugh, you know, live, love, laugh, all that hard stuff. But she put it on a clipboard and it was just all of a sudden, come on, we're all sick of live, love, laugh, aren't we? Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, but the, this idea of, you know, putting fabric on, making, making your own headboard. We crave physical activity. We're in a digital world. And so we have to have this, uh, give people this ability to personalize, to make it their own. So what do makers look for? When you're developing product, when you're developing assortments, there are three things makers always look for. Even though they don't, if you ask them, they'd be like, oh, look for something to do. Um, but there's three types of experiences that really attract them. The first is the experience of creation. They want to create something. 
okay? The second is the experience of learning. Teach them something new. And it sounds like a little bit of an abstraction, but imagine um, like, okay, my company makes, one of my companies, uh, the, company I work, the companies I work for makes Moscow mules, okay? They, or they make Moscow mule mugs, those copper mugs. So when a friend of mine gave me a set of Moscow mules for Christmas, all right, it was my husband, I was like, are you serious? You went out and bought Moscow Mule Mugs. I could have gotten these for free. He's like, I just thought it was really cool. So I opened the box. There's like a certificate. There's a recipe book for six different Moscow Mules. There's a muddler. There's all the things that I wanted in there. And this idea, like I really, I, I swear to God, I use them um, because that gave me that learning. It gave me creativity. It gave me something to do. And the last one is the experience of sharing. Okay, we are share whores. Anything creative we do, we got to put it out everywhere for everybody to see. It is the, it, it is, we share our creativity to not be creative is like the modern sin. <laughs> so we get on Pinterest, we get on Facebook, we go out there and we share it. Help, help people find a way to share it. The social maker, okay, so there's two types of makers. Social makers and functional makers. The social maker is where the money is, okay. Social makers focus on creative exploration. They focus on, create, on personal development. The, the, they do a lot of making for family and for friends. Um, they do a lot of social sharing, both social media and in-person gatherings. They, they, they make, they bake, they, they create. Um, and achievement for the social maker is defined by creative and aesthetic innovation. Doing something that nobody's ever done before or doing something that they never thought that they could do. Okay, so framing, entertaining, crafting, decor gifting, this is all social making. Um, the other, by the way, is functional making. Functional making is people who, um, how can I put it? People who grow their own herbs. Okay, great example, lots of people grow herbs. It's not a creative thing, you're a functional maker. You're growing something to replace an outside resource. People who um, pattern their own wallpaper, okay, with those rollers, use raw Lauren paints to create textures. This is a maker of sorts, but they're functional makers. They're not doing it to be social, they're doing it to replace outside resources because they believe that they can do it better themselves. Health is the new wealth is the next trend. So the healthy home. Now, if Pottery Barn can put on the cover of their catalog the healthy home, it's everybody's business. You know, so I know that you're thinking, well, health and balance has nothing to do with me. But lifetime health is linked 60% from our behavior, 30% from genetics and 10% to um, healthcare. So um, that means we all have a piece of it. The new company uh, that just a couple of years ago came out with these comfort mats that you know just sort of cuddle your feet while you're doing the dishes or uh, working on your car or whatever. Um, you know, so there is a part of this for everybody. It's just a question of finding it. Well-being is consumed daily. So how are you enabling wellness? Enabling wellness is about educating people. It's about inspiring people to do better. It's about, again, saving time. It's about providing lifestyle solutions, and we're gonna give you a couple of those. Um, understanding that mental health as well as physical health is important, which is, it sounds like a small thing. It's big, because I will never fix this body, but mentally, I may stand a chance. Um, and when you look at using technology, reducing stress, okay? All of these, health and wellness used to be about a physical ideal, okay? It was about going to the gym X number of times and, and uh, it was about, you know, big muscled bodies and teeny tiny waists. And now health and wellness is a very different attitude. It's about doing the best you can for you today in this hour. Um, but look at the size of this business. Global health and wellness. 574 billion in healthy eating and nutrition. Fitness, mind, and body, 446 billion. The global wellness economy exceeds $3.4 trillion. We have to get a piece of this because these are the things that are going to keep us alive in this industry. And here are some examples of some people who are doing a great job of it because aromatherapy, very, very important part of it. That this generation, the generation being born today, is health and wellness is in their blood. If trends hold, a baby born today might easily live to be 110 years old. I mean, that's incredible. It's a long time to be selling to people. <laughs> so, um, and health and wellness can be luxury. You know, it doesn't have to be just, mm, it can be absolute luxury, such as this $9,000 shower head, which provides chromotherapy. So if you wake up feeling crappy, 
you put on the orange and you're going to have lots of energy and you know. So uh, I just got like an LED candle that I hold to my face while I'm, you know, taking a shower and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that works. I couldn't afford the other. Um, very important thing when we talk about health and wellness. Two different generations think very differently about it. Boomers and millennials, very different approaches. There are two things that are shared across all generations though. The first is an understanding that the choices that I make today have a strong impact on my future and good nutrition and regular physical activity can help me be more productive at work, okay? Um, but look at how different generations think about different things. Let's talk about millennials, age 18 to 32. Now their approach is proactive, okay? They're gonna, be, they're gonna get healthy before they get sick, okay? So um, their wellness focus, healthy cooking skills, nutrition, physical activity, and stress management. Because millennials are just really starting to experience stress in a very real way, a uh, very everyday life way. Now let's look at Gen Xers and Boomers. This is ages 33 to 69. Their approach is very different. It's attentive, it's preservative, it's reactive. When I say preservative, it's like, I feel great now, I wanna keep feeling great. Um, or when I say react, that's mostly Gen X. Um, when I say reactive, that's like, I have got to repair everything I've, been do <laughs> everything I've been doing to my body for the last 20 years. You know, it's time to fix all the things that I've done. You know, I'm, I know I dropped too much acid in college and I'm just gonna go back and I'm gonna fix it. Um, so, and their focus is on preventing injury and chronic pain, nutrition, physical activity, and exercise and disease prevention. Pain prevention is very important. Those mats are selling because of pain prevention. So, um, and then we say, what are they most likely to buy within the, the next 12 months? Candles, 80%. Fragrances, 62%. Diffusers, 40%. So we just look at a $3.2 billion candle industry. Candles are used in seven out of 10 households. Do you have a piece of that business? Um, also, inspirational decorative accents, also very important. The way that we, we surround ourselves with daily sort of mantras, ways to feel better about ourselves. Um, this idea of haiga, which took me three months to figure out how to say it, um, it's uh, again, this idea of less, less, less. Less to have around you is less to think about, less to worry about, and less to be responsible for. And the last one is consumers take control. Um, Consumers Take Control is really about the demand for innovation, okay? So we've reached a critical mass for anxiety. The majority of consumers want to buy less, okay? Um, and they want, you know, they want to concentrate on things that matter. The good news is that we're all in the business of things that matter. So it's, it's really a question of just, if I had to say one thing to walk away from this with, it's stop selling objects. Don't sell objects sell emotions. Stop selling things and start selling experiences. Because millennials don't shop for things. They don't need stuff. They don't, and none of us need one more peel or one more candle. But the candle that, that evokes an emotion, that evokes an emotional response, the thing that makes you think of your mother, your childhood, you know, the sex you're gonna have tonight, you know, those are the things, the enhancing experiences are what's important. Millennials re look at packaging 45% more than boomers do. Because boomers think we've got it all figured out. You know, oh, it's a candle. Oh, I know it's those colors. You know, but millennials are genuinely engaged in the visual of things. Um, shoppers that engage with retailers on multiple channels make purchases more often. It's what we were talking about before. I'm not gonna go into it. ABC Carpet. Any of you who go to New York, you always go to ABC to see what they look like. They've got an amazing presence online now. And they're like all of you. They spent this time thinking, okay, I can't, uh, I can't, you know, I, I can't possibly recreate what I have in store online, but they do. So this just gives you an idea of that. Um, this is showing you how digital, digital platforms have grown. E-commerce now accounts for 18% of home and housewares, housewares and home furnishings. Very, very important. Um, we never thought that it, we were always like, even five years ago, we were like, yeah, books and records. That's where it's gonna sell. But it's not, it's our categories now. Staying strong means staying unique. Why do we shop local? When consumers are asked why they shop local, 56% say it's to find one of a kind gifts and 60% say that it's to support the local economy. Be local. 
And then these are just more about consumer expectations, yada, yada, some great companies that are doing a terrific job. Um, just pay attention to intangibles. You know, pay attention to an experience that is completely unique inside the retail environment. I love this quote from Euromonitor. The feeling of anthropology is like walking into a hug from your kindergarten te art teacher. <laughs> you know, and it's so true. So are you creating that? And if you're not, how can you create it? You're in the happiness business. So when we say, what are consumers looking for? I just put a list down the side of the things that keep coming to the top. Guidance and knowledge, new experiences, creating new memories and traditions with family, expertise and bragging rights. Inspiriences, anybody know what an inspirience is? An inspirience is when you experience something at a restaurant or at a bar and you br are able to bring it into the home, like s'mores makers, those are an inspirience, sold millions on millions of them. Um, Ways to connect with family and friends, flawless mobility, savings of space and time, relevance for their lifestyle, and inspiration to create my style statement. So that, these are the things to focus on. There is not a single one of them that focuses on an object. Thank you all for having so much time. Does anybody have any questions? I know it's a lot to absorb. You'll have it all online. Um, but uh, thank you for giving me so much of your morning. Any, anybody have any questions? Yeah. I'm going to ask you to come here because I'm old and, <laughs> oh, there's a microphone, okay. <laughs> I wanted to know yes. how much uh, new consumers and millennials care, care about products being manufactured in the U.S. I wanted to kind of get okay. your thoughts on um, that. Made in the U.S. is, honestly, um, it's, it's slightly more of a regional concern. Uh, Coastally, people understand, you know, in, in the middle of the country, people are very much in, because there's a strong association with made in the U.S. and saving jobs, okay? A little bit less sensitivity to it on the coasts. Um, but realistically, I think many people realize that the products, that many products made in the U.S. Um, are going to be more expensive. So when you have, I think that it's great to stress made in the U.S., I think as a retailer, hemming yourself into a domestically made product is going to limit your scope later on. Um, you know, I think that uh, it's, you know, it, it's sort of like when, I'm going to draw, uh, draw a, a, a parallel. It's sort of like we want to create jobs in fruit picking, okay? But if that's done primarily by, um, by uh, labor that's coming in from Mexico, for example, uh, then Fruit's going to get more expensive, and then all of a sudden, people, you know. So it's it, it's it's sort of like that with domestically made product. When you can do it, yes. Can should you make it a part of your assortment if you possibly can? Absolutely. But I would not limit yourself to it because it's a nice to have. Like like um, eco friendly is a great parallel. Consumers love eco friendly product, but the bottom line is the minute it's a little more expensive, they stop buying it. You know, and so it's just a word of caution. You know. Um, also now just when talking about green product. Understand that right now consumers, millennials don't, boomers feel so guilty about what we've done to the environment that we feel like it's our job to buy green, do green. Um, and millennials have a very different attitude. Their attitude is that green is corporate responsibility much more than the individual. That at the manufacturing level it has to happen because um, because a corporation can make this big a difference, whereas a consumer can make this big a difference. So, you know, it's, it's important to understand that as well. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi. Hi, thank you. What do you see as the biggest threat to the modern day retailer? <sighs> hmm. <laughs> and for my next question, I'll be curing cancer. Uh, <laughs> no, I. <laughs> I think, um, <laughs> I think irrelevance is a tremendous threat. I think it's so, it's so easy to lose relevance quickly. But believe it or not, I think that's less of an issue for smaller retailers. Because one of the things that small retailers have on their, on their side is speed. You can change your look in a matter of a couple of months if you need to. Have any of you ever been to a co store called Story in New York? Amazing, unbelievable. This woman, uh, Rachel Schechter, I think her name is, 
or Schechtman or something like that. Go to thisisstory.com. This woman, every month, and she's, she's recorded it all every month, she complete, no, every two months, completely changes her store. So it's called Story. So first, like February, she'll do Love Story, and it's everything from sex toys to, uh, to condoms to beautiful art prints of, uh, of nudes to, uh, I mean, anything you can imagine, to just romantic pillows. You know, um, then the next month it's uh, about um, color story and everything will be about color. But she just takes what interests her and what she feels is out on the sort of on the ether and she makes it happen in store. Evolution is, is the key to success and to survival. So I think the biggest danger is being too big to move with alacrity and to evolve quickly. Anybody else? Thank you again for all of your time. You've been terrific and very patient. Thanks. Have a great market.